Yeah. Well, hello and welcome to the rock and roll to success. Today I have my friend who's pretty much the modern day Leonardo da Vinci, Keith Hayden. Keith. Yeah, man, you're Thank such you. a polymath. I, yeah. you know, you were one of my inspirations to start podcasting because when I first started following wow. you, I saw that you had a podcast and that yeah. you did animations with voiceovers and yeah. also you write books. You were yeah. on the military. You yep. are a beast in fitness. You run. <laughs> you know how to speak Japanese. You live in Japan. Yeah. You, you used to live in San Antonio. You have so many things going on. And even like we were talking about before we started recording, even your mom and your wife can keep up with everything. Yeah, so, it's hard. It's a welcome, man. It's Thank you. an honor to have you, Keith. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to live up to the hype, man, for the whole list that you just listed off. Uh, You're the real true. deal, man. Appreciate it. I had no idea that um, I had inspired you to start podcasting. I'm honored to hear that. I didn't. I didn't know that because, you know, when you put out this stuff, you know how it is when you're a podcaster, you know, you have interviews or you do like little things and it's hard to get feedback on your podcast. It's hard to know, OK, how many people are listening and are they truly listening? You know, are they walking the dog? Are they washing the dishes? You know, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how it's, your experience has been, but that's the way it is for me. It's hard to tell. Yeah, it is. It is hard to tell. And sometimes you get the most unexpected feedback. Yeah, But yeah, man, like before starting, I always thought that it was something too hard to begin or to get people to show up. And actually, it's pretty easy to start a podcast Very. when you go to the nuts and bolts of the thing. But yeah, before you start, you're always kind of thinking of the you kind of overthink about stuff. Absolutely. But looking at all the things you do, man, I was inspired really inspired it was like yeah man that awesome. guy's pretty great and so it was <laughs> it was awesome for me when we first started becoming friends because it was like yeah mm. man i guess i'm heading on the right direction yeah man and i and i'd say that about anything you know it it seems so intimidating whether it's a podcast a book um writing a song everything that i've done every stage of it i remember being that beginner when I was like, oh, holy shit, I don't know how to write music. Holy shit, I don't know how to publish a podcast or publish a book. And now I've done several of those things several times over. And it's that is the great thing about the time. One of the great things about the times we live in, it's not hard really to do anything. All you need is just a little bit of patience to maybe watch a few tutorials or ask somebody and go through, you know, you're going to go through a, a few false starts on your own, but it doesn't take much to actually get started. Yeah, everything is figure outable if you have YouTube. <laughs> Absolutely. YouTube University. So what was the first time that you started delving into this more creative side of yours? Um, it's definitely after I left the military. And since I'm working on my military memory book or my memoir from my military time, I'm thinking about this a lot lately. But yeah, when I was in, it's been fairly recent. I left the military in 2016. And up to that time, I had a few false starts with the blog and things like that, but I I hadn't really tried to do anything on my own. And I'd always liked writing, and I was an okay writer in school, but I had never written my own books or anything like that. So it was around that time, 2017, the year after I got out, that I was like, okay, let me start blogging. Let me see about this website. That's when I set up my website for the first time. And I was just dipping my toes in. Uh, I just really, everything just kind of built on, was a foundation, was a step to the next thing. So blogging took me to try out vlogging on YouTube. <laughs> and after that kind of went belly up, then I was like, okay, then let me try the social media thing. And at the time I was in a completely different niche. I started out in the language learning niche because that's, I'm really into learning languages. You mentioned um, I speak Japanese, which is, which is true. I speak Japanese very well. And I love learning languages. So I was connecting with all these other language learning influencers at the time. Uh, this was like 20. And that got me started into social media. I did a few podcasts like this early on. And that then that led to like, okay, let me try and write a book about this. And so that led to my first book, The Tower of Babbling, about language learning. And everything kind of just went from there. 
Awesome, man. Yeah. And now that you mention language learning and this journey, were you already living in Japan when you first started? No, actually. How I got into Japanese is an interesting story. I actually took French in high school, which I'm born and raised in San Antonio, Texas. So French is kind of an odd choice for a foreign language to take in high school. For some reason, they offered it. I don't know why. But, and I can't even remember why. I think that, there was a girl that I liked that was in French. I can't think, I can't remember why I picked French. Oh, and the Spanish teacher, I guess she was a real, um, she was very notorious. I remember her name to this day, even though I never took that class because the Spanish teacher would just rip you up. Anyway, I took French in high school. I took three years of it. I got pretty decent at it. And then when I got to college, we had to take a language placement test. So I take the language placement test and they gave me Japanese. I was like, why? What the fuck? Like, and so I asked my counselor and she was like, oh yeah, they thought you could handle a, a tougher language than for <laughs> English learners. And I didn't like it at first, man. I was just like, cause Japanese is hard, man. It is especially in the beginning, everything's backwards from English and the way the sentences and the vocabulary, everything is just crazy. But after the first year, I kind of took to it. And so I didn't come to, to Japan. I came to Japan for the first time when I was a junior in college. And I did a, no, I was a senior. I'm sorry. It's my senior summer. I did a uh, immersion program for three weeks and went to a place called Kanazawa. Uh, Kanazawa is in Ishikawa-ken. Actually, it's in the same uh, prefecture as where that earthquake was at the beginning of this year. So it's in the same area. Didn't get hit as bad, but yeah. So I went there for three weeks, and that was my introduction to Japan, and it was great, man. I remember just like, you didn't really have to do anything. Just like go to the gym, ride bike around town. Because that was his assignment, you know, go use the language. I was, oh, that's easy, you know. And then we had some classes during the day, but they were pretty easy. So, yeah, that's how I got into Japanese. And I've been learning off and on ever since. That was that was almost 20 years ago. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. And when you got to the military, how was it as well? Because you were on the Air Force, right? Yeah. Yeah, I was Air Force. So the school that I went to, I went to the United States Air Force Academy. And I don't know if you've heard of the American Service Academies, but these are special military schools that they feed directly into the military. So in exchange for a full ride scholarship to one of these schools, you agree to do time on the back end on active duty in whatever branch of the military. So of course there's a army academy, there's one for every branch, and then there's an air force academy. So I went there and that's basically when my military career started because you're, even though you're a student and you're in cadet status, you're basically already in. Every day is a training environment and they remind you every day that you're already in. <laughs> you're wearing uniforms, uh, you, you've got the, the balance of academics, not just a regular college environment, but you've got military training on top of it. And then there's an internal structure to your dorm that is also a military hierarchy. So you deal with that. And then after you graduate, you get commissioned as an officer in the Air Force. So that's what I did. I commissioned as a personnel officer. It's about as interesting as it sounds. It's not the, the most... It wasn't a job for me. Um, I still have friends that are, that are personnel. Two years in, I cross-trained into special investigations to become a special agent with the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. And that's a lot, a mouthful of words, but essentially it's, you've probably heard of our more famous counterpart, um, Naval Criminal Investigative Service, NCIS. They do the same thing, except they're, we do the same thing as them, we're just not as famous. We don't, <laughs> we don't have the the long running CBS TV show. Uh, but it's the same job essentially. And yeah, it's about as cool as it sounds. At least it was the, in the beginning. I liked it a lot. So you were pretty much a military detective. I was, I was definitely, I had badge credentials, um, carry a duty weapon and I would wear shirts like this here cause I was actually posted here in 
uh, Okinawa, Japan at, at the base. So I would work here and got to work with just awesome, our international counterparts, Japanese counterparts, uh, other police, and just running cases, criminal investigations. I was young. It was, it, this was like a dream job back then, man. It was awesome. I loved it. And how was it moving to Japan to actually live there and stay there instead of just for a trip? Yeah, it was a dream job, man. It was, like I said, it was, I was young. I knew the language decently, which a lot of Americans, when they come over here, they don't. They know maybe a few words, but I knew enough to like understand other Japanese people. So that made it, opened it up even more. I, I didn't feel restricted to stay around the areas where Americans hang out. I kind of went wherever and it was a dream, man. Living here, working here, Japan is an awesome place. Have you ever been over here? Not yet. I still haven't been to Asia, but uh, I'd love to, man. Yeah, man, it, it's it's awesome. I uh, uh, It's just so, the vibe is so laid back. It's definitely compared to the U.S., it's cheaper. It's more affordable. Um, safety is nice here. And it's just a beautiful island, uh, Okinawa. They generally maintain it really well and i just love it like i i've actually lived in hawaii too after i lived here i went to hawaii and hawaii is known for its nice beaches too and hawaii is very picturesque but i don't know i prefer okinawa with the culture here the japanese culture it's more my speed yeah you mentioned it being very laid back but is that yeah. a Japanese thing or more of an Okinawan thing? Because when you it's, think of, yeah, yeah, like the Tokyos and the Osaka, yeah. you think of. Yep, you're right. Um, that is more specific to Okinawa. And Okinawa is this very special place just because it is a blend, uh, quick, minor, I won't bore your listeners, but minor history lesson. Okinawa isn't historically Japanese, unlike the rest of Japan. Okinawa came under fairly late in the Japanese history, um, recent in relative terms. For centuries, Okinawa, the island, they were, uh, what they call it, a tributary to the Chinese. They were a tributary to China, so they, because they were closer to China, they traded with China, and so they were kind of a, a waypoint. But they had their own kingdom for several centuries, and just like many island nations, they were doing their own thing and then the japanese came down and said one day you're japanese did you know that and they were like oh i didn't know <laughs> they're like yeah okay come up, come to tokyo and 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 uh pay reverence to the to the emperor and so that was in in japanese history and then it wasn't until very recently 1879 that's when okinawa officially becomes part of japan so we're talking you know 100 plus years and then, of course, following World War II, that's when the American influence really, we had control, administrative control of the island until 19, and then it reverted back to Japan in 1972. And fun fact, I was actually here just two years ago when they had the 50th anniversary of the reversion back to Japan um, in 20. So all that to say that Okinawa is a very much cultural blend, unlike main Japan, which is very Japanese authentically and from the original standpoint okinawa is not that way and it's a way different vibe because of it and do you think this has anything to do with so many people living to be 90 100 100 plus <laughs> it's so funny because okinawa is known for that right it's known for the longevity the the blue zone the funny thing about it is that you know i was just talking about my wife last night we'd be forgetting how old we are now and i remember when that <laughs> I remember when that book came out, that book was like, and maybe it was like 10 years ago, honestly, it's been a minute because I actually just saw an article two years ago that they're, they're losing their status, man. Like really? too much McDonald's and Western. Yeah, those I mean, Americans it's, it's over there. Our, I know it's all us, man. You know how we do. We come and just fatten you up, make you, <laughs> make you get unhealthy. And that's what's happening over here. Um, and it's not just that it's a mixture of the diet of course the changing values because they i also read that there's more of that you know like you mentioned the tokyo lifestyle it's busy it's you know go 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 on the rush a lot of uh younger okinawans are adopting that lifestyle now they're less about the 
the slow life, the shogunai. Shogunai is like the, uh, you know, it's it whatever happens. This is Japanese for it's there's nothing that you can do about it, right? So shogunai, and yeah, there's less about that life, and so they're getting they're working longer hours, they're eating shittier food, and you know longevity is going down because of that. That's a shame, dude. It is. It is. Yeah, it's too bad. But I will say that they still do maintain, like, you would literally see, like, I live in a, a fairly rural part of Okinawa, and you would just see just Obachan, like, old grandma, just walking down the road, and she's, like, 85, 90. And that's one thing they, they do really well, like the older generation. They get out, they walk, they're outside all the time. They will just shut down randomly. This is one of those things you have to get used to down here that maybe it's not even a thing in mainland japan but you know on google they'll have like oh this place is open from like 8 to 1300 or whatever you go there at at 10 o'clock they're closed and this is just a normal thing like just sometimes they people just randomly close and you know for whatever reason it's it's normal and it's accepted here that that's part of the lifestyle that we're not just about work my wife and I always joke, we don't know how some of these places stay in business because they're open like three days a week and they'll be super popular. They're open for like five hours, three days a week. And then that's it. No more food. They don't sell anything else. They're done. It's like, how do you run a profitable business if you're not even open five days a week? Like I understand weekends closed, but I don't know how they do it, but they survive and they've been around for a long time. This is, this is the lifestyle. Yeah. And going back to your San Antonio days. Yeah. How far from living on Okinawa or from living in Hawaii was the lifestyle back in San Antonio? Well, so I actually grew up in San Antonio. I'm born and raised there. So my experience of San Antonio is I don't have experience as an adult there. I guess that's what I'm saying. So, and it's interesting because San Antonio, I don't know if you know this, but San Antonio is a huge military city. So it's the home of Lackland Air Force Base. And that's where the entry point, the enlisted entry point into the Air Force is. And so a lot of people that I know through the military, they associate San Antonio. They're like, oh yeah, that's where I went to training. And then when they get out of training, you know, they go downtown and all this stuff. And I'm like, I don't know that side of San Antonio. Because I grew up on the southeast side of town, and it's more rural, it's more industrial, it's less built up, um, and that was my childhood. My high school and middle school, my middle school was brand new at the time, and it was basically in the middle of a of a field. <laughs> there's nothing else around it, like, and it was just one of those roads where it's just field, field, field. Oh, there's a middle school there. And then you go further down and some, now some more fields. There's my high school. And that's that was childhood for me. So I like to say I was raised like half city, half country. But I feel like the country is still kind of in me. That, that's where my kind of heart is. I prefer the open spaces. Like I love it here in Okinawa where we live right near the beach, uh, very close to the beach. And I think I prefer that over the city. But, you know, we would go in town every now and then and just, you know, go to little places and things like that. And I was just talking to my best friend yesterday and we were like, his uh, fiance was like, don't you, don't you know anything about Wendy's? You know, they were talking about Wendy's. And I was like, <laughs> we didn't go up. There wasn't, there just wasn't, we had, Bur no, Burger King was kind of even far away too. We had Taco Bell, we had Dairy Queen. Um, and it was always the same rotation of places that we went to. When I was a kid, but as far as comparing San Antonio to being in these other places, it's different, you know, just home. There's a reason why I left. And even when I was younger, when I left 17, 18 to go to college, I knew that I didn't want to stay in San Antonio because it's just kind of this, uh, you know, it's just kind of a small town type feeling where the teachers that I had growing up had grown up there and this very much like a generational thing now i see uh people that i went to high school with now they are teaching in mm -hmm. the school district and they're in charge so it's just a very generational you kind of just 
live there, born there, die there. And that's fine for some people. But for me, I always wanted to get out and do my own thing. And so I basically never went back. I mean, I went back to visits, of course, but I never went back to establish roots there. I just, it's just always as a visitor ever since I graduated from, from high school. Yeah, I guess since you've always liked um, learning new languages and trying yeah. to speak French so you could <laughs> get in touch with that girl and or going to speak <laughs> Japanese later on. Yeah. So do you think you always had that sort of a wanderlust or uh, did you always want to travel to meet new, to know new places? And I that did, was part man. of that. Absolutely. When I was a kid, one of the things that I loved, I loved maps. I loved geography. I was a kid that in third grade, I had memorized all of the U.S. state capitals and they didn't ask us to. I had went the extra mile and memorized all the world capitals as well. I went nuts, man. I love this stuff. And so I think I always imagined that I would, that I would leave and that I would go out and do my own thing. And yeah, the, the languages are definitely a part of that as far as experiencing other cultures more deeply. And I've traveled extensively around the world. And so just going to these different places, you're right. The answer to your question is, yeah, I have always had that kind of, uh, I wouldn't call it wanderlust. I, I care less about like putting my feet on the ground in different places and country count, I guess. And more about like, let me see what this culture is about. Let me, mm -hmm. what what are these people like? And I love history as well, as you can tell. And so I, I just like placing myself in the context of wherever I'm at. And I like being able to place myself in the timeline like that. That's pretty important to me. Yeah. So you always were a <laughs> geography nerd and a history nerd or a nerd yeah. in general. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. man. I, I totally agree with you about trying to see how people really live somewhere. So yeah. the difference between being a tourist and an actual traveler. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And what's your favorite place that you could really experience this apart from Japan, of course. Right. Okay. Uh, let's you know exclude Japan. And you've lived there for a while, but apart from mm. that, what's your favorite place? Mm, favorite place, man. I've actually never been asked this question. No, I'm not going to say that one because that one, it didn't really grow on me, even though it, it was probably the most interesting place. Favorite place that I've spent a lot of time in. I'm just going to say it because nothing else is coming to mind right now. Uh, so yes, last year I went to Mongolia and that's this stands out for me because it's just, it's one that a lot of people don't go and their tourism is just starting to pick up. They, they're not really big on tourism yet. But yeah, that was a recent one that I was like, yeah, this is an interesting place. I think they were very much uh, fascinated by me just seeing a, <laughs> seeing a black guy. I, I'm serious, man. I had people come up to me. There was a guy came up in the middle of the desert. We're, we're looking at this ancient bell and he's like, picture? I was like, oh no, we don't need to take a picture. I thought he wanted to take a picture of the bell. He's like, no, I want to take a picture with you. I was like, what for real so he had his kids and the kids came over and then there's a picture of just me just with the kids and my wife took a picture of him taking a picture of me it was there were several times like this where people came up this one kid wanted to arm wrestle me like he you know gave the universal the symbol just out of the blue he saw me and he was at a rest stop and so I, we rolled in there and he was like so we saw him, he came back again, and he was like, oh, it's the black guy. It's him. He's back. Hey, man. You know? So it was just interesting that way. But um, interesting culture. Um, just cool to see a country that not a lot of people get to see. I mean, so many open fields. I mean, if you've ever played uh, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, it kind of has that vibe to where there's just horses just, like, running around. And they're owned by people. But they have so much land that they can just have the horses run. And then there's like a little shack or a little house over there. And that's where the caretaker is. But he's nowhere in sight. She's nowhere in sight. It's just the horses running. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. But I haven't spent... I think about it. I haven't spent a lot of time in 
other places like this compared to Japan. I mean, I've spent like maybe a week or two the standard tourist stuff, but yeah, I haven't spent. I I can't speak to really anywhere else, other than of course the U.S. and Japan. Yeah, Mongolia seems very interesting because it's so sparsely populated, but it's actually it a huge country and. <laughs> they have a lot of like these kind of desolate lands, like the desert, yeah. and the fields. Yes. And yeah. since you are a guy that loves nature, I guess that plays yeah. a part in you liking it. Yeah, I do. I I didn't used to be a nature guy. Um, I'm still. I would consider myself more a history guy than nature, but I've come to appreciate it a lot more. Like I definitely appreciate the space. I think that's what I like. The openness, um, when I when I see that, I'm like, okay. Instead of being confined in a city, several years ago, you know, I mentioned I lived in Hawaii, and when I lived in Hawaii, even though it's an island, I lived in downtown Honolulu. Not not mm -hmm. technically downtown Honolulu, but I lived in the city. I didn't live off um, somewhere else, and that wasn't really for me. I think that kind of colored my experience of Hawaii, just because I was just out of my element, and so since then. I prefer to have some distance, and thankfully, my wife is the same way. We enjoy kind of more quiet, you know, like you're not going to have a lot of traffic, a lot of noise, and so now we have other noises around here. We have these these cats to be making noise. The neighbor has this weird dog that I don't know what's wrong with that dog. Something wrong with that dog. And then there's a bunch of cows and stuff around here too, and so you have those noises. But I mean, it's it's better than like drunk guy. 2 a.m., you know, that type of noise. City traffic, you know, beep, beep mm -hmm. around you. Yeah, I prefer that. So do you think you guys are more on the introvert side of the spectrum? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm more of an extrovert. She's definitely more of an introvert. But, like, together, we we barely go out. <laughs> we, we barely, like, go out like that socially. We go out and do other stuff, but we don't go out, uh, like, party and shit like that. We don't do that that much anymore. But yeah, we like to keep to ourselves mostly. And she she loves to travel. Like just tomorrow, we're going to uh, Sapporo in Hokkaido up north. We're going there for a snow festival. And so if you're, I don't know if they're familiar with geography of Japan, but Okinawa is like way down south and then up north is Hokkaido. So that's where we're going tomorrow. So just little trips like that. Um, yeah, she's a huge traveler. I can't keep up with her when it comes to traveling. And like I have to sit certain trips out where I'm like, okay, I'm just tired. I'm, I'm gonna stay home. So she's more of a traveler than you, and you let her go alone sometimes, so you can have yeah. that time for yourself. Yeah. So I can just, I mean, sometimes I just don't want to go, and it's gotten worse as I've gotten older. I'm just like, I, I joke that the part of the trip that I look forward to most is coming back home. And I guess <laughs> everything else is... you have so much going on, man. And yeah. Yeah. Like when you're traveling, do you do you think about oh I have to record this or I have to write that? Do you get that yeah. or can you immerse yourself in the trip? I mean, I can turn uh, turn it off, which is good, and that's one of the reasons why I bust my ass so much when I'm here, and so I can have that kind of freedom and flexibility, right? Because I'm not, I don't really treat this as a nine to five. I, I like, I don't clock in, clock out like that. It's just more of like whenever I feel good enough to work which is most times which is probably like 90 percent of the time um, then i will do stuff but it is nice i do one of the things i do like about traveling is that it takes me out of my element and as you know for creative work because at the end of the day i'm a creator you know that's what i call myself an artist entrepreneur and it took me a while to embrace both labels to really be like no i am an artist i'm making these creative decisions all the time, whether it goes comes to writing or creating music or making graphics, I'm making artistic decisions. But then the entrepreneur side is there as well to where, you know, the consistency, the messaging, the the relations, things like this. I mean, that's like, OK, those things are important, important as well. So when I travel, of course, I can't do that as much, but I've gotten really good over the last several years at using my phone to do stuff and that's been a game changer because i don't have to lug around my laptop anymore i can pretty much except for like big stuff right like i can't record a, well i could record a podcast on my phone if i really wanted to but i can't like edit the podcast i can't like 
push it out and publish mm-hmm. it, right? But I can write. I've written a lot of uh, my first novel, Serious and Limnick, was written on the phone, on the phone. I write notes all the time. Of course, I can record videos. Of course, I can still do social media. So there's a lot I can do with just my phone. Um, I've kind of trained myself because in the beginning, it was really hard. And I think it's interesting meeting somebody like you uh, further on uh, because when I was younger, I was not a technology guy, man. Really? I didn't hate it, but I avoided it. Like I would back in the day, I would only use the computer to play games and do my homework. And that was high school and then earlier. And then in college, same thing. I would only do it that I wasn't really into social media because of being in the military and it, it was during wartime. So we had certain restrictions on what we could post and how much we could post. So I wasn't barely into social media. I didn't start getting into social media until like 20. I wasn't even I had profiles, but I barely used them. So it's very recent. I mean, and I wasn't very technical. I, if you had met me 10 years ago, I wasn't very technical. I was a writer. That's kind of how I thought about myself. I didn't even think about myself as an artist. And so this recent iteration, these last, I want to say four or five years, is where I've kind of come online technologically and not a moment too soon. Because here we have all this AI stuff and being able to marry these technological concepts with natural language with AI is really has been a huge uh, advantage for me because you can I can do both I can do the fuzzy stuff of the writing and the artistry but then I can also do the technical stuff I can I'm comfortable with code I'm comfortable in the command line I, I don't mind going in there and to get certain things done I had no idea this combination would obviously become a thing but it has, and it's been a huge advantage. And then the the third leg of the stool has been the business stuff. And that took a while to come online. So really, the artist came first, and then the technological guy, and then the business stuff has been the most recent. So the business stuff, oh, sorry, yeah. I thought we had yeah. a bit of lag there. I... Yeah, yeah, there was a little bit of lag, yeah. <laughs> I'm good. I'm still here. So you mentioned the business stuff came later and yeah. maybe it's something you're still working on. I but am. as yeah. you were talking about this, about not being such of a tech guy before, I was thinking about your brother because your brother <laughs> is a huge computer nerd, right? So do you think you guys were sort of balancing each other out? You were more of the artist type and he was more of the tech guy? It's interesting with my brothers, uh, mainly my older brother, um, because we all have that capacity in us of being an artist. And when I think of my older brother's arc, yeah, it's pretty much the opposite of mine. He started out very technical. He taught me a lot of the technical stuff that I, that I knew, especially when I was a kid. I remember he taught me Excel for the first time, like a long time ago. Yeah, he, he showed me how to get into that stuff. But he also had the artistry stuff in him too. I mean, like I mentioned in that episode of our podcast he would just build these just magnificent, just amazing Lego constructions out of nowhere. I don't know where he got the inspiration, but they would be huge. And I remember specifically this one Christmas he got, my parents got him this Statue of Liberty Lego set. And it was meant to build the Statue of Liberty. So you build the Statue of Liberty, you know, you follow the instructions, easy. Within like a week, he had taken that thing down and he had built an original building that like filled with passageways and all this stuff. And of course, there's no directions for this and there's no internet to look up directions. He would just, he would just build it. And so when I think back to those things and there's other stuff too, that he, he, he composed some early music when we were kids. I still remember the song, a few of his songs that he made when I was a kid and I mean, this is the 90s, you know, so there's not a lot of tutorials teaching teenage kids how to make music on a computer. It just don't, it doesn't exist. And so he taught himself. He would, I mean, he's an autodidact. He's a polymath. My brother's a genius. Um, he is. He's, he's so smart. And he's already, he's always had the artist in him, but 
he doesn't have a lot of patience for the business side, the social media side, this side that we live on. Yeah, he just doesn't have the patience for it. But as far as that artist side, yeah, we, we do kind of complement each other in that way, especially since I tend to spend a lot of time paying attention to at least keeping my ear to the ground, like what's going on, curtain trends and things like this. Um, he's not that way. He will do the the hermit on the hill thing. He'll, he'll be the guy in the cave, and he'll come out every now and then and see what's going on, and then he'll dip back in. I mean, that's that's just more of his style. So I think in that way, we definitely complement each other for sure. Yeah, that's awesome to hear, man. <laughs> so back to this business side. Apparently, yeah. it wasn't as natural for you as the artist part, and no. also going into tech. Although it wasn't something that was as natural as the artist side, it was right. something that came quite naturally to you as well. Like you said, it was inside of you all the time. But what yeah. about the business side of things? Do you mm. think this is something that's, that you had to work more towards or that mm. you are working? And what have you learned? What are the main points? And if you could start back from scratch, what would you change in this journey to make it happen faster? Oof, man, lots of good questions there. So, yeah, the business side has been tough, mainly because I haven't, the hard, I, this has been a challenge my entire life. I have to end up reinventing the wheel because I don't know where to start. I don't have anybody. And some people, they have people to immediately, they say, you want to start a business? Okay, let me hook you up with this, 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 that. I didn't have that. I had, they, we did have a class when I left the military. It's called Boots, Boots to Business, and it was supposed to like teach you entrepreneurship principles. But looking back, it was very much based in more traditional business of you have a shop and you get a small business loan, and then that's how you operate. It wasn't aligned at all to the business that we know of the digital first internet business. It wasn't that at all. And this was 2016. It's not like the internet didn't exist, but that's just the military can be a little bit slow sometimes to adapt. And so I was basically on my own. And so I look back, most of the business principles that I've learned, I've learned from following other creators. And one of the first creators that I found when I got out was Pat Flynn. He was one of, he was like the original entrepreneur that was... You know, he was obviously a couple steps ahead of me in, in entrepreneurship, but we were similar in age and we had similar interests. So I followed him for a while. And then then I got started doing social media a lot more Then I found the Nicholas Cole stuff, Dickie Bush, the whole Ship 30, that type of uh, ecosystem. And then following them because I'm just fascinated by dude has a degree in fiction writing. And he's just like a millionaire. He's become this like huge um, just business guy. And I was like, damn, I mean, fiction writing, you think of a more useless degree. I mean, <laughs> no offense. If you, if you're listening, you have one, I'm sorry, but I mean, damn, that's, that's a tough, that's a degree of love right there that you, you just love it and you don't care if you're going to get work. Um, and so the fact that he's gotten that degree and, but then he still has turned it into a profitable business. I follow him, his stuff a lot. Because I'm like, that's pretty much the model that I have. I'm a writer first. I do that better than anything. And so, yeah, I naturally want to turn that into my business. But, yeah, man, as far as what would I change to start over, I don't think I could make it go any faster. Because I had the standard hang-ups of trying to sell myself and how do I think of this art that I created, like my first novel. How was that a product? You know, it's it's hard to, it was hard for me at least to think of that as a product. Now it's a lot easier for me to, you know, take artistic key glasses off and then turn on business glasses and be like, okay, now I can see and I know how to talk about it. And that, it's such a simple flip now, but man, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but it is a thing. And you, when you don't have the vision, yeah. when all you're doing is writing or making or coding or creating, then you don't know how to talk about what's good about your stuff. You don't know how to talk about it in a way that it's appealing. And it, however you think about sales, that's how 
that's how you get people to pay attention. I mean, you can't just say, hey, I wrote this huge book, come and read it. You know, I wish it wasn't like that, but unfortunately, that's not the world we live in anymore to where you can just pop up a sign and be like, hey, this is Gabe's podcast, come and listen to it. It's great. He's a great guy. You know, you, you can't do that. You got to do all this other stuff. You got to do, like we were talking about before we started recording, you got to do this, play this kind of game just to get a few people to find it and let alone listen to it. You're just talking about finding it, um, not actually engaging with it and possibly like trying to get them to like it. I mean, that's the challenge uh, these days. And so learning sales and business stuff helps with that. And so it's taken a while. I don't think I could have done it any faster because I didn't have the business mentorship. I didn't have anybody directly giving me feedback and saying, okay, you're doing this right. You're doing this right. All my stuff is just, okay. Just follow the signals. Are people listening? Are people commenting? Is there any... I didn't even know how to do that. That's that's such a simple thing to me now. You know, post stuff and then they tell you... You know, you hear the same thing all the time. Signal to noise, you know. Make signal, listen for noise. That's type of basic thing. I didn't even know that a couple of years ago. You know, I was just making a lot of noise, but I didn't know... I didn't have a signal tracker thing <laughs> to pick up on what was really important. And then I definitely wasn't letting that drive my decisions for what I was creating or whatever. Now I've gotten a lot smarter about that. But in a way, it's good because I've learned how to do it more deeply because I had to do it on my own. And that's the way it is with everything that I've done. The same with music, the same with writing, podcasting, coding, because I it's just a school of hard knocks. And does the shit work? You know, that's the test at the end of the day. And if I can get it to work, then I know I've done something right. And then the next step is, okay, how do I actually package this? And that's where learning graphic design has come in, book cover design, all these other adjacent skills um, has really come in handy. Because unlike other writers, a lot of writers who they all they know how to do is write the book. That's it. And I see writers now that I'm like, I feel bad for him because I know what it's like to be that writer who's like, man, I just worked months, years on this book, but I have no idea how to sell it. I have no idea how to talk about it other than I wrote a book. You know, what do you say? And yeah, I know that struggle well. And now that I'm on the other side of it, I'm like, yeah, I'm at a huge advantage because I can take that book and turn it into an advertisement. I can turn it into a video. I can turn it into a podcast. I can turn it into a song. And using these AI tools, it makes it even easier to compose between these different these different mediums, as you know. And that, that's that been a huge game changer as well. It is. And like we were talking about before, in these platforms like the X's of the world, LinkedIn, Facebook, they punish you for trying to send people yeah. out of the platform. So if you put a link, well, t take a look at my podcast yeah. or my book or whatever it is, my service, whatever it is right. you're offering. If you yeah. post a link that's out of the platform, they will punish you. They will de-boost your post so that less people can see it. And right. I've seen that you've right. done a lot of things to try to get out of the grip of the platform. So you're focusing more on your own website, for instance, yep. and making sort of your own portal yep. for, to host all of the things that you've already done and the things that you will do in the future. Right. So how did you come up with this idea or this realization that you should do this? And why? Right. Just so the people listening can get the business sense of it. I missed the question. It was lagging a little bit. What was what was the question? Oh, yeah. So, so what was the thought process behind this and mm -hmm. behind focusing on your own website? And how did you get to this, yeah. to this realization so that people that are listening to us and that might be facing similar problems with their own offerings or their own products may at least not waste as much time as you did to get to all of these, <laughs> connect all of these dots. Yeah, uh, there's two things that I can say about this. One is very strategic, the other is kind of tactical. I'll start with the strategic thing. Um, you, gotta, you gotta own your own space. Um, and everybody knows that. Everybody knows that 
the X's and, and LinkedIn's of the world are, are borrowed land. That's what you're building on. That doesn't stop people because the temptation is, there's a lot of components that go into why we spend so much time on social media. You know, for the first part is there's cool people like you on there. You know, like there's potentially other Gabe like people that I could vibe with. And you're always thinking like, okay, maybe I could connect with somebody else, whether even, even if it's for exposure or if it's just for, to make friends, you know, to have a good time. And that's for a lot of people, you know, a lot of people are just looking for like-minded people to share their passions with through social media. I've seen a lot of that on, on X especially. And there's, there's these communities that have shown up. So you've got that piece. Then you've got, of course, the business dynamic. You know, it's this slot machine of all it takes is one person to see one thing that you, you know, if you hit the jackpot and somebody happens, Elon Musk, you know, people do this, invoke his name. And they're like, yeah, Elon Musk, Elon Musk. You know, they'll just say the name just to, <laughs> hey, just in case he happens to be taking a shit and happens to see, oh, yeah, okay, I'll retweet this, whatever, who cares? And then next thing you know, you have thousands of followers and your career and your business is, is blown up. It, it, it's playing that slot machine, right? The problem is, the metaphor I like to use, social media is like the street. You can never really own the street. That's the problem. And the challenge is, that's where people hang out these days. People hang out in the street all the time. There's millions of people in the street. And whatever street you're on, whether you're on TikTok Street or Instagram Street or X Street, th this is where people find stuff now. They don't, nobody surfs the web anymore just to surf, you know, like back in the day where you would just get on and be like, let me just see what's out there. Nobody does that anymore. It's all, it's become more siloed to where the only time you go to the open web is for answers is for quick searches and now AI is drying that up as well. And so it's like, what can we do as business owners, as entrepreneurs, as creators who are like, okay, I, I can't live in all of these places at once. I have to have a central hub. And so that's where the strategic thinking comes in. It's like, okay, where do I want my hub to be? It cannot be on X. It cannot be on LinkedIn or Facebook. It's just too unstable. They kick you off. They shadow ban you. They, they de-boost you. It happens every fucking day. I'm not going to build there. I'm going to build where something's stable. And so that's the strategic thinking where my first point to where I want to make my website the place where people find my stuff and engage with my stuff. Okay, so then how do you do that? You have to give people a really convincing reason now to get off of the street. And the street analogy works great, right? Because on the street, you've got Wendy's, You've got a museum, you've got an abandoned building, you've got homes, right? Certain places are more appealing than others to go into. And I would ask yourself, you know, if people are listening to this, what are you offering on your website that people can't get on social? And that's a hard thing, right? Because now on social, you know, X is openly wanting to be the everything platform. They want you to post your videos. They want you to post your writing. They want you to post, you know, do your business stuff there. They want you to be on spaces. Um, it's the same with Facebook. Facebook has everything now. It's a video platform. It's, it's a writing platform. It's the same deal to where it, that's the intent is that you never leave Facebook, that everything's here. Now they have AI stuff going in there now. Uh, it has a lot of features. And so technically, you could build everything on Facebook. You could build your business page. You could build, you know, have your chat. You can have your AI assistant. You can have all of this stuff, and you would never need a website. That's what they want. The problem is it's still Facebook. You're still in Facebook Tower where they can shut off your power and shut off your water, and they can just kick you off anytime. So I think that's what – and I was just thinking about this yesterday, man, because it, I'm not going to lie. This is hard to do. It's, it's hard to do now. Even when I first started back in 2017, it was a lot easier because you could still get traffic to your website. You could still um, have people just, you could just post a link and people would just go to your website. Now, more and more, as we've talked about, the website is discouraged. So here comes the tactical piece that I just, 
I just was thinking about yesterday. Where you post first is where you will put the most effort. And I say that because if you want to drive people to your website, you should not start by posting on X. Because by the time you get, even if you have like a robust repurposing system, which I do, which a lot of people don't even have that. They will just post or they'll copy and paste the same thing. But you can't copy and paste the same thing when you're doing this. Because once people consume your shit on X, they have no incentive to go to your website. You need to do the equivalent of an upsell to get people to your, to your website. So you need to find a way to tease what you want them to consume. Like, And I'll give you an example of yesterday. Yesterday, I did a 2024 goals update, and it was just a 12-minute video, but I wanted people to watch it on my website. So I made a blog post, in, embedded the post, and the full post, that's the only place where the full video lives, is embedded in a blog post on my website. That's the target. Now, to get people on X, I used an AI tool. It's called video.ai, you get free credits. I used that and I got a clip from the video. It made like a 50 second clip, perfect. So I inserted the post in the clip and then in that clip I said, here's the, here's the post and then I'll link to the video, the full video a little bit later after I post on X. And I don't know if it worked. I don't know if it was effective, but this is, I mean, and, and I've making it sound simple because I'm I'm really fast at repurposing shit. Like literally I spent two hours repurposing. I, I don't even know how much I repurposed because I did it so fast and I could differentiate now using AI. It's a lot faster to make different versions of the actual without posting the actual because you want the actual to be on your website. You want to point them mm -hmm. to somewhere. So what you don't want to do is copy and paste everything same because especially in between social media platforms, right? Because your social media platforms should be the top of your funnel. Everything should be flowing down here is where you want to capture people, whether that's your email list or you're trying to get clients or get them on a call or whatever. It should be down here. It should be down in the bucket. Social media, okay, get a few of those. to You can copy paste there, but they should be pointing back down to your website, your landing page, your newsletter, whatever you have. You have to have that target thought out because if you're just posting randomly uh, or, or you're just going X first because that's where you default to because that's where the homies or the homegirls are, then you're not thinking like a business. And that's the thing you have to ask yourself. It, are you in it for the business? Are you really trying to make a business or are you just trying to make friends or are you just you don't know what you're doing? That's what a lot of people are. That was that was me for a long time. I was just kind of posting because I was like, OK, I got I wanted to learn how to do this. I wanted to get the reps in, but I wasn't I wasn't thinking business minded. So now that I am, I'm thinking about this stuff a lot and it really requires a lot of foresight. And then you have to have the technical knowledge to and the patience and the time to be able to take whatever you want, whatever you're making, and then chunk it down to where you don't end up posting. Because in the past, you had no choice, right, but to link out. Now that they've all they've all gone to longer form videos, they can all accept larger files. It, it doesn't take much time at all to upload these this stuff. And so that's the temptation, right? The temptation is just, hey, I'll just post the whole thing on X. And but then, okay, you're not going to get them to your website. You're probably not going to get them to sign up for your newsletter either because then you're, you know, you get busted down if you link. And so you have no choice but just to rely on the link in your bio. And most people don't go to your bio. So it's a risky thing. So you have to kind of find a way. And by the way, you have to do this a lot too. You can't do this. I mean, you can do it once a day, I guess, but it's not going to be effective. Like this shit moves so fast that it, the the expectation is, I mean, in my experiment yesterday just proves it. I posted five, six times yesterday morning, once an hour, just to kind of see, just to see if it boosted my account. It definitely boosted my account. It definitely boosted my account. Six times in one morning. Who can do that on a regular day? I can't even do that on a regular day. And I have the time to do that. But I was like, I couldn't do this every day.
And so it, it's pretty disgusting <laughs> that that's what you have to do. Yeah, to be honest, I <laughs> wouldn't be able to read like myself six times a day. I mean, and to come up with like good stuff. I mean, and like I said, I have a system to where I've trained AI to basically in my voice, in the stuff that I'm talking about, so I can make good posts really fast. But without that, to just do cold posts, like cold start six times a day, get out of here. It takes too much time. It takes way too much time. And then on top of that, the engagement, like if you actually get engagement on your stuff or if you're engaging, you're, do, you're doing reply guy, reply, reply girl tactics. This shit takes time to go and hunt down stuff that you actually want to respond to. You know, it, it's it's a whole process. And I think that's what they want, especially for us creators. And it, it's it's a racket, man. Yeah, I'm more and more just like, I, I was describing it to my friend yesterday. I said these platforms are becoming more and more anti-human every day. Yeah. When I think about it. They're anti-human, man, because they're, they want you to, you have to interface with the algorithm first. Before I can talk to Gabe, before I can ensure that you see my stuff, which I don't even know, I can never be 100% sure if you specifically saw my stuff. I have to interface with the algorithm first. I picture it like this gate guard, this sentry, this algorithm that every time I walk into the X building, he's checking my papers. He's checking my posts. And if he doesn't like it, then he's like, okay, this goes at the bottom of the stack. Maybe it'll make it to the floor that Gabe's on. Maybe we'll take it. Eh, maybe not. And I think that sucks. That's, that's shitty. That, and it, more and more, every day, I've seen it happening over the last two years. It's gotten worse. And I've been, I started on LinkedIn in 2022. LinkedIn was my main thing. And then I slowly transitioned over to X, Twitter at the time. And I saw... It, it's just become worse, the algorithmic control. And then you, it's sad because you see some people who become slaves to the algorithm. They, because they want to juice their account or whatever, they spend all day on, on spaces. They spend all day posting. And it's like, how can you do anything else if you're doing that all day? How can you run a business? How can you live a normal life, you know, outside of X? Not checking this damn thing every day or every hour or every minute. And I don't even have notifications on, thankfully. Thank God I turned that shit off years ago. I have to go in and I have that forcing function to where it's like, okay, I'm going to check this on my time. It's not going to be inserting itself into my life. But still, it's still a challenge because at the end of the day, and it's not just X. Like I said, X is the one we know the best, but um, all the other platforms are the same. You, you have to pay the toll in order to reach people it's not people first it's become inverted it's become flipped and so how can we get back you know just to own our, your own space and it sucks that you have to go through all this shit to get websites because you can't get traffic anymore seo is dying a very quick death to ai because it's just they're summarizing your website it's already aggregated so you've seen it you know you search and there it is being is like oh yeah Gabe does this that you don't need to click into his website and so you lose that and then social media punishes it's like how the hell are you supposed to find a fucking website and well, how do you see you, know, you gotta go through one of these channels the future man not good yeah yeah uh, i see more algorithmic control it's just gonna get more and right now these algorithms i'm talking to my friend yesterday and he was like yeah i, I don't use the ai summaries because you know i bought a flight and google tried to summarize my emails or something and it, and it fucked up it was telling me wrong times and things like that i'm like yeah that makes sense but it's getting better every day that's the thing it's it's getting more capable every day and so my money is on new business models there are new mis business models that are becoming viable thanks to ai but the old ones are clearly getting getting swept away like i mentioned seo so here's one of the new ones that i was that I proposed and that I'm actually testing currently with my with my memoir. It's called Readware. And maybe you've seen me talking about this, but I'll I'll explain it to people that are listening. So what this Readware is, most of the time when we think of when you think of a classic book, you think of cover to cover, right? You read it front to back, 
as soon as you get to the end of the book, you're done. But what if books were more like video games or software to where they were upgradable to where you could actually get audience feedback and integrate that into the book and you can extend the book based on the audience feedback. Now this is very normal in open source software and in video games. You know, you have games that are in early access and you can play it and then on the back end the developers are watching and listening for feedback like, oh we gotta fix this bug, oh we gotta make them jump higher, oh we gotta fix this, fix that. You don't really, we haven't been able to do that with books before. But now with AI we can. I can have you read my military memoir and you have a question about it and I can get that question, I can answer it and immediately integrate it into the book and republish the book. Now it may seem like a lot of work and it is. I'm not saying it's not a lot of work at this point. There's there's no easy way to do this. It's all manual, but being able to create so fast with AI has made that possible. Has made that possible. So it changes the game and it definitely and that's just one way. That's there's going to be a million other ways that you can actually make business models, but I think if if you're a creator listening to this and you, and you're kind of down hearing me talk about oh SEO is dying and you can't get links to your website and social media is clamping down, all of those the above are true. But there's going to be new models that you have to find the model that works for you and unfortunately, we don't have this is all developing. So there's no established playbook to where you can just go, okay, just do this, do that, and you'll have a successful business. The only thing that works is consistently publishing, um, finding out really what you want to talk about and what you want to be about, right? Like, how do you want to help people? That's the first thing you got to ask. And then the next step is, okay, now I've got, you know, the landscape. If you're starting today, then the only way is you you have to find a way to engage with social media that to the level of your comfort, right? Because last year I saw myself and I was like, this is too much for me. Like I can't do this to this extent every day like I was last year. That's why I've pulled back from it this year. But I found a way that works for me. It's a lighter touch. I don't have to spend as much time. Some people enjoy the social media game. They love going in spaces. They love interacting with people. But then it's a trade-off. You have to decide, are you trying to run a business? Because not everybody is. Not everybody's trying to really run a business. Some people, it's just about making friends. Other people, it's like they just want to host spaces because they like hosting spaces. That's fine. But then you have to ask yourself, if you're getting all these followers and you have thousands of followers, but then you haven't made a dime, are you trying to make it? Are you trying to make money? Because that's it's a different game you need to play, a different set of skills that you need to plug in. And I think we equate these followers, and I, I've read this so many times. We equate followers and likes with value. So I mean, and it does have a certain level of value, of course, but it's not monetary. But it doesn't work like that. Just because you have. 100,000 followers doesn't mean you're making $100,000. You have to do other things to actually exchange that that goodwill and those people that have said yes to you to get them to say yes to something else to open their wallets. And it's a lot more challenging to do to get people to give up their money. Even though it seems like, I don't know if you've seen this, Gabe, but when you like really interrogate what people would be spending their money on, they be spending on some dumb shit sometimes. Like... They're not spending it on like self growth or whatever, you know. They're they're shopping online. They're buying, you know. I mean, I, okay. I can. This is one place where I say where I can say I don't do this. Like, first of all, I have a wife to do that for me. She <laughs> can buy whatever she wants. Me, I'm very strict with my buys. Like, I'm I'm like, is this gonna advance what I'm trying to do? Then I don't buy it. I. I don't buy, I buy books. That's probably what I spend the most money on is books. But I don't buy video games anymore as much. I don't, I don't really buy them at all. Because um, I just don't, I don't play them. I don't, I don't need time to play them. Um, I don't buy movies. I don't buy experiences. I don't really, this is an interesting thing about me. I don't really like food. What? <laughs> I don't like, I have this thing with food, man. Like, 
Not that it makes me sick or anything, but I don't. Some people like jo- enjoy the experience of food and going out and trying different stuff, or just they like the taste of food and all this stuff. I don't like any of that shit. I'm fine with eating cashews and carrots. Cashews and carrots. That sounds like that could be a a show or something. I don't know. But it could. I just did not grow up with like a very rich food palette. It was just kind of like whatever was there. And it was one of those things like once I I didn't realize this until I got older that my mom is actually not really the best cook and <laughs> my dad really didn't cook at all. Anytime he cooked, my mom would joke and be like, oh, these are dinosaur meals because nothing was really fully cut up. Everything was just like huge and all this stuff. But so I did, growing up that way, I didn't really have that. And then I have like uh, pretty bad allergies most of the time. So my sense of taste is pretty weak. So that's part of it too. Like I just can't taste very deeply or richly. So some of it's just genetics. But because of all that added up, I don't spend a lot of time on food. So I'm mentioning this because unlike a lot of people who, some people who spend a lot of money on food, like they will go out and, and especially there's so many options these days. But that's not me. I'm like, shit. I'll just eat the bare minimum. I'll get by. And I'm really good at I think that's one of the reasons why I've stayed um, very healthy as I've gotten older. Because I'm going to be next month. Next month, I'll be 39. I'll be 39 next month. Coming up, coming up on 40 real fast. And I think I learned, because I grew up military. So three meals a day and just packing in the food and, you know, just energy, energy, energy. But... A lot of people keep up that lifestyle, but then they don't continue doing the stuff that they were doing when they were 20, 30 years old. And I'm very good on a daily basis of calibrating my intake. So if I go to the gym, then obviously I need more food. If I don't, if I'm just going to be sitting here doing business stuff or creative stuff all day, I'm just sitting. (laughs) I'll I'll drink water, of course, but I'm not doing anything physically demanding. I'm literally sitting in a chair for most of the day. Why do I need to eat a lot of food? So I'll like naturally just fast. I'll skip breakfast. Hell, man, I yesterday I didn't even eat until like 3 p.m. I didn't eat nothing. <laughs> I drink water, but I mean, that's all you need is water. I drink a lot of water, too. I'm good on water. But anyway, I, I started talking about this this fitness stuff. But bottom line is people aren't spending their money on like the deepest things or personal development all the time they will blow cash in a second and so that's that's one of the hopeful things that i think is like why can't they blow cash on my stuff they will eventually but the problem the issue is you have to keep pushing it you have to keep because people most of the time people are not seeing your shit they are just not it's not that they don't care they literally don't see it i mean our emails are flooded with spam and and ads and even like messengers and stuff like in Facebook messenger, there's ads in there. Um, it's just everywhere. This the little stuff has been inserted everywhere. So just to see like the people stuff from people, you know, can be a challenge. Just regular text messages is some of it's spam. Some of it's robo, a lot of it's robo calls. I get more robo calls than I get regular calls. Now I get more spam calls. So it's just like, if you really want a successful business now, internet business, you have to be willing to go on the long haul and be willing to repeat yourself a lot. And you need to be saying something similar to where it's pushing people towards what you do. That's that's the only way I can think to do it now. Um, it sucks that it's that way. Or you can just buy ads, but most people can't afford to buy ads when you're first starting out. So you, you have no choice but to go organic. And it's it's a long road. Just keep going. That's all I can say. Yeah, it's a hell of a long road. And sometimes when you think about a nine to five compared to being a creator or a solopreneur, it's so much more work if you think of it, because like you were saying in the beginning, you just pretty much work all the time. As long as you have energy for it, you pretty much work all the time. And if you had a nine to five, you'd be working yeah. like eight, nine, ten hours a day, whatever it was, 
for that day, but right. you have some time That's off. That's true. But when you are working for yourself, right. and you don't need to be a creator per se, you can have a regular business as nope. well. And yep. you don't yep. have time Same. off, like literally, literally. Nope. Nope. If you want to have a business, then you better be, you better be capable of doing it every day. That that's the thing. You need to have the capability and the energy, honestly, to do it every day. And my wife looks at what I do, and she's like, "That looks horrible." As on her worst days of her regular job, she wouldn't she wouldn't trade it for what I do. Because the switching, you know, like to go from. Your, this creative energy to all of a sudden you have to be a marketing person and all these different skills it's very hard for some people because it, it, there's going to be inevitably things that you're better at that you prefer to do there's going to be things that you don't like to do like social media is one of those things i don't really like to do but it, that's where people are you, you have to go where people are and so it's becomes this trade-off huge trade-off to where it's like there's potentially limitless upside to doing what we're doing but because the nine to five is capped you know you're capped by the hours you're capped by the clients that they give you or whatever but this is potentially unlimited but the starting cost is very high as far as building up a reputation building up a creative library if that's what you're doing building up a client base if you're going more client base whatever style of business you're doing it just takes time to do that. It takes time to get people to trust you. And building that trust is half the battle on online to where it's just like, are, are they going to be there for me? Are they going to actually be able to deliver what they're saying? When you go through a nine to five, you already have an established entity that has said, I vouch for you. I hired you. I'm paying you. So you, the trust is implicit. But when it's just Keith Hayden, or Gabe, it's not so obvious if it's the trust is there. You have to build that up. And you build that up by continuously putting out more stuff, by engaging with people and all those things. And I've been at this for years now. And I'm just starting to... I probably started in earnest in, 20, in 2019. But in 2021, the elements was, have been coming together. But I have started... It was really 2021. When I started thinking like, okay, after I published my sci-fi novel, I was like, I want to actually try and sell this. I want to see if I can, and I still wasn't going all in on trying to sell it, but I was like, let me try. And so really it's been three years since I started. Fortunately, I, I had some foundation to build off of. Like I said, I had been building those skills, but as far as audience building and seriously like doing what I'm doing now, it started three years ago. And... I'm just starting to see some reliable traction. It, it's taken that long. So if, you're, if you've only been at it for like a couple of months or whatever, if you've been at it for less than a year, then I'd say you just need to have more patience because it's not, unless you, you know, win the, the X lottery, you know, you win the slot machine, the jumbo, jumbo jackpot, which you probably won't win, then you just have to wait. Because some people do win the jumbo jackpot, you know, they get the one off, you know, and of course those become the, the big stories. That's what everybody talks about, but they're outliers. For every one of those, there's probably tens of thousands of people like you and me who have just been slogging it out and creating stuff and making real relationships. And sometimes you, it's worth it. Sometimes it's slow. Sometimes you get a shadow ban. Sometimes you make a few bucks here and there, but there's nothing consistent. And that's most people's reality. Yeah, I think there are many jumps. It's like climbing a staircase or a ladder. The first yep. big jump is going from a consumer to a creator. That's a, I think, yeah, it's a probably... huge, huge jump. That is my consumer to creator moment was 2020 was COVID. I had been following the endless news cycle and the updates. And I decided after a couple of weeks of it, I was like, I'm done with the fear mongering. I'm done with the headlines. I'm just done. And so I was like, shit, I'm going to go learn Chinese. So I went and taught myself a good amount of Chinese that summer. And that's when I started my first podcast, by the way. 
my, it was just me reading my first book. That was 2020. And since then, I, I haven't really looked back as far as the consumption. And I've been very, almost to like an extreme to where it's hard for me to sit down and like enjoy playing a video game or enjoy a movie because I'm like, no, I, I want to be building up my skills or I want to be building another asset or I want to be working on another book or something. I really much prefer that. So there's a balance to be struck there. Uh, fortunately, I have my wife to keep me grounded with that. But yeah, that's a huge first jump is seeing the other side of social media, seeing the other side of the internet and seeing like, oh, there's this massive vehicle that you can use if you tap into it. You just have to find a way to plug into it. And that's a simplification of all the stuff that we've talked about. But essentially, that's what it is, is finding a way to plug in your skill set, what you like with the people on the other side, because you can reach them. I'm talking to you. You're over in Brazil, dog. I'm in Japan. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, man. like on the other, other side, side of the planet of the from each other. It's crazy. Other side of the planet. And we're having this conversation. And when you let that sink in, that you can talk to somebody else that has doesn't share your background, doesn't share anything that you have in common, but you can have a common dialogue. That is a huge game changer. And maybe somebody listening to this podcast, they're, this is that light bulb moment for them because it it's not obvious. Upfront social media is just scrolling. And now it's like, as we've talked about, it's stronger than ever just to keep you on there, especially if you're a consumer. Oh God, like, I mean, shit, how, how am I going to create anything if I spend 20 minutes, 30 minutes at a time scrolling on TikTok or scrolling on X? You oh, have that, no man. energy like, to do anything. No way. Because your dopamine is so fucked up. No. Yeah, man. You're just out of whack. And I'm so glad I got out of that, especially with the AI shit coming online. Um, like, it's just endless. It, it never ends. It's literally, it, it just be endless. And so that's the first thing is making that leap. And then it's, you get into that, okay, so now I'm on the creator side. What do I make? What can I sell? Who can I connect with? Then you have to ask if every one of those is a step too, because it's not obvious up front. It's not. And then it's like, how do I talk about it? That's another step um, on and on and on. Some people get lucky with this. They get handed a playbook. Most people don't. Most people, it's on you to figure out. And a lot of people, they don't stick around long enough to really see it through. They post a few things. The things get ignored. Of course, they don't get any traction because most stuff doesn't. Um, that's the way it was when I started writing. I posted my Medium articles. I remember, just like everybody, you know, I'm like all these first articles. I spend hours on them and all this shit and try and make them perfect. Nobody saw that shit. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the way it is. That's the way it is. And so we spend all this time on those original works, but then nobody's going to see them just because of the way. And that was back in 2017. Now it's even worse now. I guarantee you nobody's going to see you. The first time that you post something on X or on a blog or anywhere, nobody's going to see it. Unless you, you know, obviously your friends, your family, they'll, they'll support you maybe. But the people that need to see it that you don't know, they're not going to find it, man. So it's just worth it to just start. That's the hard part. Yeah, man, taking that leap and then there are so many moving parts when you first start. It can be a daunting task to, for going from a beginner to yeah. starting to think about it as a business and then monetizing and so many things you have to learn, so many hats that you have to wear. It's hard. Yeah, man. It's just so many pitfalls too. Like, And I've gone down a lot of the pitfalls. The affiliate marketing bullshit, the SEO, like, thankfully that stuff is, is dying out because it's just not going to be sustainable in the age of AI. But that's where I started, you know, like affiliate marketing and, oh God, I when I say it, I get a just a taste in my <laughs> mouth. Just, <laughs> it just, oh man, it's it just feels so scammy and just so, and I know it's not, you know, there's legit affiliate marketers, but it just the way it's presented to you, especially if you don't know. And that's what happened to me. Like I went down that, that rabbit hole. I paid for this, this crazy course and you know, they made all the promises and it's like, this is just 
kind of scammy at the end of the day. It's kind of weird and you don't know who to trust. You you know, you just kind of get what's in front of you. And unfortunately, there's a lot of predatorial people, you know, like these these ex Twitter gurus grow your account and just do this, do that, follow my system, whatever. You got people with like a thousand followers making these systems. Mm-hmm. And it's like they haven't even figured out growth. They haven't barely figured out monetization. Like their monetization is you staying broke, is you continuously stuck in the cycle. And I never liked that that monetization scheme because my background is in education as well. I'm a certified teacher. I used to teach math in high school. And so my job, the way I see it is I want to graduate you out of what I'm teaching. I want you to eventually learn it. But unfortunately, there's a lot of business models where the model is to keep people confused and keep them broke and keep them scared and keep them scrambling because of how are you going to keep your customers like like that's not a very good business model to graduate people out but i know that's what i want to do so that's why i focus on courses i focus on books and things like that where i can okay i can have this kind of building library to where if somebody finds my work then they can get my other books as well but yeah there, unfortunately there's a lot of people who want the quick cash and they'll they'll set up a uh a lackluster course overnight and you know what I'm talking about man you may even know some people who's doing this and that it's it's not the best quality they don't really know what they're doing but yet let yet they're charging you hundreds of bucks to learn this system that it man I and I know and the reason why I can talk about it because I've bought some of these fucking courses <laughs> Did you? <laughs> and I've gone through the systems, and some of them were mildly helpful at the time, but most they rarely delivered on their promise. You know, I mean, look at my account. Yeah, it didn't. It didn't deliver on the promise. Yeah, man. Too many scammers out there, and like you said, they don't really care if you get results as long as you keep paying them. No. And exactly. yeah, at least yep. for me, the best that I got so far from from Twitter, from X, was that I could meet some awesome people. And in terms of monetization, in terms of getting a bunch of followers, I wouldn't say I got that much of a result so far because I've got like 500-ish, a bit over that in terms of followers. And Mm -hmm. sometimes I feel a a bit like it's a bit of a daunting task to get monetized. But at the same time, I think that it also yeah. has to do a bit with seeing your own value and the value of the things that you can put out there as well. Absolutely. At least for me, it has because Absolutely. like a few months yeah. ago, I would think, yeah, but what do I even have to offer? Why would someone want to buy something from me? Or how could I coach someone on anything? Right. And going through right. all of this process, at least it has been eye opening for me because I see that many people who are worse than me in many aspects or that didn't do anything special, they're selling their things for hundreds or even thousands of dollars. So why the hell not? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. No, it's true. And I like how you talk about the value in yourself. That's a huge part of it. Like you have to see the value of yourself first before anybody else can. And that's hard. To go out there and say, and plant your flag and say, okay, no, I I know how to do this. Whatever it is, what's coaching or writing or making videos, whatever you do. It's hard to do that in the beginning because you don't have any proof. You don't have any proof to yourself that you can do it. And that takes time to build up. I mean, it's the same. Like, it's one of the reasons why I didn't call myself a musician for many, for over a year. Even though I had made like 30 plus songs in my first year. I didn't call myself a musician because I I didn't have any proof. And I think about that today, even though I've written so much, I don't, I'm not one of those guys. Like, I don't think I've ever gotten any compliments on my writing. I don't think I've ever had anybody tell me that my writing's good. Like in the internet era, I had it back when I was in school, but that's different. Um, Writing on my own. I don't think I have. So there's still part of me that's just wondering, like, is this hitting? Is this is this any good, especially like when it comes to fiction and 
aspects of writing I want to be good at. X writing and shit like that, I don't really care. But, like, fiction, I'm like, I'm actually trying to get good at this. And without that, there is this kind of lacking. Like, it, there's a time when those things come together and it just supercharges everything. Where you're like, okay, I know I'm good at this. And everybody is validating me that I'm good at this. And so then it's like, okay, well then it's easy to, your value, you, it's easy to see the value. But my point is you'll go a long time before, like I'm saying like, and I write every day, every day on the internet, on my phone, handwriting. I write all the time. I'm a writer and I still haven't really had that with my personal writing. I haven't had anybody come and tell me, okay, is this any good? Same with my podcast, you know, like I've gotten some feedback on it, but I haven't had that validation piece, that strong validation that, okay, this is what you've put together, like as a collective package is good. And I'll tell you, you won't get it unless you, a lot of people pay for it now. They pay for coaches who are basically, you're paying for them to, to guarantee that they look at your stuff. And give you feedback on it because that is so rare to get good, honest feedback. That's not like this sucks or one star because, bleh. you know, it, it's really hard because people have so much choice and ever. So they're a lot pickier and they think they're experts on things, but they're really not because they don't know how to make anything. They just know how to consume it. So I've had this often with my podcast and <laughs> stuff. So people will tell you stuff. It's like, okay. And it's fine. They know what they like, but I've noticed that people can be more vocal now with because they can totally shit on your stuff and then just go swipe a finger and then they found something that they like. So it, in, in that sense, it's harder too because people are harder to please. They're not just grateful and satisfied that something's there. There's a lot of shit there, but they're looking for that thing that's for them. And I will say, you know, as depressing as some of this conversation has been, why not your stuff? I say that to myself all the time. People like random things all the time. Why not my stuff? Why not my music? Why not my podcast? And people have chosen my stuff over other people's stuff. And you just have to believe that, especially when you're starting out, when you don't. Because I couldn't have... Two years ago, I, I couldn't have spoken like this because I didn't have the proof. I hadn't finished anything. And that's another thing I, I would say. Oh, shit. I, I got to go soon. <laughs> There's like two minutes left. But just become a finisher. You got to finish things. So many people leave shit undone. They start a huge project or a series or something like that. And then they just flame out. And I get it. You know, like I spent three years adapting my novel into a podcast, into an audio drama. And that spanned... Not just three years, but multiple disciplines, music, sound design, writing. Uh, then the AI stuff came online. So I started learning that you have to become a finisher. And I think that was an unlock for me at the end of last year because I finished that huge project. I was like, if I can finish this, then basically I can do anything because this was so hard. This was so long. And there was so long many times where I was just posting into the void and I didn't even know if anybody was listening. I saw the numbers going up, but you don't know, you know what I'm saying, with the downloads. So you have to be willing to go through those that period of time to where you're just not going to hear anything. And then eventually you'll start hearing a few things, and then you can follow that trail. And hopefully it's successful. Hopefully it leads to success. Yeah, man, I think you hit the nail on the head when you talk about proving to yourself that you can be relied upon, that you can do the thing that you want to do. Right. And man, this has been an awesome conversation. I know you're a bit like you don't have much time left. So I'd like to ask you yeah. one question that I always ask people. And what's sure. your definition of success? Definition of success. I think I wrote this in your form. I have to say it. And I'm thinking about this word a lot. It's it's bravery. It's daily bravery. It's not the likes. It's not the cash. It's not, it's not even like the reputation, right? Because I've seen in the past how that shit can just go in a moment. It can be gone. I mean, I, I've experienced uh, moments in my life to where it's just like, okay, your, your name's worth nothing now. You thought you were worth something and to other people it's gone. So 
that's one of the reasons why I called my military autobiography, I called it my name, Hayden Brave. Because that's what I want to be for myself, for my wife, for my friends, for anybody. I want to, I, it takes bravery to, to do something like this every day. Every time you publish something online, it's a risk. It's a risk that it's going to be ignored. It's a risk that people are going to read it out of context, that people are going to just railroad you off. It, it's, it's a risk. It's not a, a, a big risk, depending on what you're posting, but it is a risk. And it's all about having the bravery and courage to take that risk, especially if you're serious about actually making money from this or actually achieving your goal, whatever your goal is. If your goal is make friends or whatever, it's about putting yourself out there. And that takes bravery every time. So I know every day if I'm being brave, if I'm doing something that's a little bit hard, then I know I'm successful. I can call it successful. And I wrote that at the top when I did my website redesign last month. I said, now I run a successful business. What's the definition of a successful business? Is it 5K a month? Is it 6K, seven figures, six, seven figures? You know, yeah, that would make me even more successful. But the fact that I've spun up a business, I know what it's taken me to get here. Like the mental hurdles, everything we've talked about, you know, getting from consumer to creator to adding in the business to adding in the tech stuff. I've made just, I've evolved myself in so many levels. I look back to who I was just five years ago. And I don't recognize that man. And because that wasn't, he didn't have the capacity to do what I'm doing now. But at the foundation was that bravery. And that's what makes what I'm doing now a success. And I know the the financial success will follow. But it continues into that bravery, right? Of believing that everything that I've been doing up to this moment is building me, is compounding to where eventually that energy exchange is just going to turn into dollars. And recently I've seen signs that it's already turning. It's already happened. It just hasn't made its way back to me yet, into my wallet. <laughs> it's like the more you help That's people, the more you, you put stuff out there, it can't help. It can't help but come back to you and different. And that's what you do every time you post. And that's the thing about something like X. It is a slot machine, but it does, it spins every day. And I have tweets and posts from years that have been randomly surfacing. And I'll look at I'll look at my notification and be like, oh, I tweeted that back in 2022, 2023. Nobody saw it back then. But now they've seen it. And now it was helpful for them. Somebody saw it. Somebody, for me, just seeing a black face. Just seeing, because that's a thing, man. Like, it's definitely a thing that, um, I don't talk about it too much, but it's, yeah, it, it doesn't help a lot of times that people will discredit me, they will look at my stuff and are automatically assume that it's lower quality just because I'm black. I know that, and that happens. It's, it's happened in my entire life. And it's on the internet, it's no exception. It just happens at scale. And that's something you got to be brave against, too. That whoever you are, okay, there's going to be people that just don't like you just because you look like you do and you're saying what you're saying. And in their mind, you have no right to say it. You got to be brave to take those shots and still keep showing up. Man, you are brave. You're a brave motherfucker. And I appreciate all of this and how being brave every day and trying to be a bit better and trying to confront your own fears and the things that we think that we can't do and doing this day by day by day. And like you said, you can even recognize the key from five years ago and I think that's that's the thing that you, know. you must strive for, like being able to look back in time and feel a bit ashamed of, wow, how did I think that way or how did I do those things? Like feel that you've evolved so much because you're taking those risks and you're doing those things. And in the last bit, I was thinking maybe you should target the Mongolian market because people seem to... <laughs> I liked you there. I know. I was very popular there. I actually got some Mongolian books too. 
Yeah, I thought about that. Because, I mean, they're a small market, man. But if you got something in Mongolian that had, like, Mongolian mass appeal, man, it would catch fire over there. I thought about it. Yeah. I, still, the, I have the a, books behind me. I have this. I'm, like, kind of a collector of language books. So I have a, I have a bunch of them on my shelf behind me. Yeah, man. It's the definition of niche, picking a smaller country in terms of population, of course. Who knows? <laughs> Maybe we can't <laughs> translate your biography to <laughs> Mongolian. That is true, man. That's, man, you give you give me too many ideas. Yeah, that's the thing with this podcast, man. I like to give back as much as my guests give to me and to the audience. And I think you've given so much. You've teach. You've taught so yeah. much to anyone that's listening. That I hope that they give you a yeah. bunch of feedback and they follow you and they by your biography, because now I'm interested as well. We didn't even have that much time to talk about it, but I hope that next time we can talk more yeah. about it and maybe use it to launch or to help you get some clicks, some eyeballs on it, and hopefully some sales, because I think that will be awesome, man. Yeah. I, I, I'm really looking forward to knowing more about for sure your life and how it was and i really like the cover you look good on the cover man that was funny yeah that picture was me I, I picked a picture that i was i felt like i was at the peak of my career and i was actually taken here in okinawa but that picture is 11 years old it's crazy but yeah i had some studio prints done and the shirt that i'm wearing is a traditional okinawan shirt it's called a katayushi shirt and yeah, it's just, yeah, I love the look of that. I always liked that picture. It, I always thought it looked a little bit slick, you know? And so I was like, shit, this has got to be the cover. And plus, I didn't have a lot of surviving pictures from my military time. Like, a lot of them are old print pictures, but digital pictures. I was like, shit, I don't, they're all on old CDs and stuff. <laughs> I don't have them anymore. Old school. If you want to plug your site, your biography, the things you got coming up. Yeah, I appreciate that. So main thing I'm working on is my military memory book. That's what I'm calling it. It's called Hayden Brave. It's already up for pre-orders. You can go to Hayden Brave Book uh, dot card dot co, and then you can find the pre-orders there. It's already available for pre-order on Amazon. And then the Readware version, if you're interested in trying out this new experimental version then to where you could actually get your questions in the future versions of the book then check out the read for read where version that's on gum road that's also available through the landing page and then my website keithhayden.net that's as we've mentioned that's where i'm trying to my stuff in the future and so you can find that stuff there and then i am still on x uh reluctantly but i'm still there uh it's at kh underscore author i'm on linkedin as well you can just look at my name keith hayden and that's me yeah man i hope that more people get to know you because like i said in the beginning you are an inspiration because of everything you've done and you do you. and like you said being brave every day and showing that showing first of all i think the most important person is always yourself that you can do something that yes, just by going to bed and thinking that you did something that you thought you couldn't and like facing those fears, I think it's a beautiful thing. And man, thank you very much right. for coming. It was such a blast. And I know that anyone no, listening you. to this, thank you for will have a lot of fun and get a lot of value, man. Thank you so much. Arigato, I'd say. No, I re really appreciate you. Uh, do it as much day. You're welcome. <laughs>